Our bodies are portals. Every time we drift into sleep, we step through a gateway into unknown worlds. Walking through the void, passing through darkness and light, as the atoms of the universe rearrange themselves into vision, prophecy, messages, and memories. With the ego left behind, we become the creator once again, weaving together the very threads of reality through our dreams. I am Stella Porta, Stargate, Incarnated Angel, Dream Oracle, Artist, and your guide and bridge between the seen and unseen. Welcome to the Dreamweaver Podcast. Welcome back, you beautiful dreamers. I'm Stella, and I'll be steering this dream ship today as we continue our journey into the astral abyss. With this episode, we're going to talk about what dreams are made of. What are dreams? What's their substance? Where do they come from? How can we even do this? Like, how are we even able to dream? I mean, from a scientific perspective, We've only known about the existence of REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement, since 1953. And that's really not that long ago. But if you're looking for the quote-unquote real science behind dreaming, it remains a disputed topic and probably will be as long as they continue looking at it solely from a methodical lens. And for the purposes of this podcast, that's really not what I'm about if you haven't figured that out already. (laughs) I'm looking at the metaphysical or spiritual practice of dreaming, given that everything must pass through the non-physical before it can become physical. There are interdimensional stargates. Actually, let's call them dream gates. And each of us has a key within our subconscious that unlocks certain gates that are specific to us. There's a lot of talk about the ego in the spiritual community, the New Age community, religious communities, and I'm going to point out that the dream time is a valuable example of an ego-free environment. Because let's face it, when when you dream, you don't doubt anything in your dreams. We all believe that what's happening is real. And that's the difference between dreams and reality. That doubt is the ego at work. Notwithstanding dream divination, think of the healing that can be done through dream work making that quantum leap out of the egoic field into this astral plane in the dream state where we're using it as a real realm of information, connecting streams of energy throughout the cosmos. This is what I referred to as the cosmic web in last week's episode. Can you close your eyes and visualize these streams of energy as threads connecting to an infinite universal web that contains all information? This is how I see the knowledge field. Learning how to work within these dream gates is a very powerful tool that's been used by indigenous peoples and shamans for eons. They used the dreamscape or astral realm as an entry point or gateway into the knowledge field. We could call this the Akashic records or source, God, divinity, whatever matches your resonance. I mean, what better way to truly disconnect from the ego than the six to 10 hours that we sleep and temporarily check out of this third dimensional material world. People can get so attached to the idea of meeting their higher self, their soul, their spirit guides, their ancestors, or even just on meditating in general or not being able to meditate because it's hard or they have too many thoughts, they're easily distracted, they can't sit still, and that does sound like me sometimes. But what if I told you that you always had access to this infinite knowledge field, this cosmic web that connects you to the secrets of the universe, and all you needed to do was fall asleep? Keeping to the title of this episode, let's explore a few ancient civilizations and cultures and their beliefs around what dreams are made of. As we go through them, I'm not going to speak to them in a particular order or in a linear timeline. We're just going to go where the current takes us. Also, before we begin, I'm going to apologize in advance for the mispronunciation of any of these cultures 
as well as individual names. I really tried to find information on how to say them all correctly. And one site gave me one way, another site gave me a different way. So yeah, please forgive me in advance. Sharing dreams, which is the act of storytelling, working with dreams, attention to dreams, interpreting dreams, is the most popular form of divination known to humans since as far back as we can trace. When my husband and I lived in Australia, we learned how the culture of Australia's Aboriginal people is founded on what is called the dream time. The original custodians of the land believed that the entire world was made by their ancestors in the dream time. It's a beautiful story of how the universe came to be, events that have happened, how human beings were created, and how their creator intended for humans to live within the world as they knew it. Different tribes had different philosophies and beliefs about the ancestors who made the world. Some believed that the ancestors were animal spirits. And one animal of particular importance was the rainbow serpent. And I've actually had a few dreams about a rainbow serpent myself, but I'll save that for another time, another day, another episode. Dream time is the foundation of Aboriginal religion and culture, and it dates back some 65,000 years. They hold the belief that the dream time is a period on a continuum of past, present, and future. The concept of time has often been likened to a flowing river, but I visualize it the same way as the Australian Aboriginal people do. Instead of a river, it's represented as a lake, a contained body of water where past, present, and future are all happening at once. I'm going to quickly share a dream where I was shown this concept of time with a beautiful visual. My dream journal says it occurred on January 8th, 2022. And when I was waking up in the state between sleep and wake, which I call the in-between, and I'll expand on that towards the end of the episode, I received an explanation of time with a very clear visual. I was shown a circle cut into four quadrants. It actually looked like the astrology symbol for Earth, and I believe it's also the alchemy symbol for Earth. And each quadrant acted like a doorway or portal. One was the now, another the past, one for the present, and another for the future. And they all intersected and met in the middle of the circle, creating a cross, a circle cross. And it was wild because a few months after I dreamt this, I bought the Earth Warriors Oracle deck, and within it there is actually a card with this exact symbol. It blew my mind. It's called the Circle Cross of Tenen, and it represents a rare intersection of heaven and earth. It might be hard to visualize, so I'll send a screenshot of my dream journal with the symbol in it and what I was shown in the next newsletter. And if you're not subscribed, there is a link in the show notes for you to sign up where you'll also get a free art print that is exclusive to subscribers. And I might create a podcast highlight as well on my Instagram so I can share this stuff there as well and kind of have it like archived so you can go back to it whenever you want to especially if I paint any of the dreams that I share with you, which will definitely happen. <laughs> Western civilization is quick to dismiss these dream time creation stories as myth, but I need to point out, and it's actually quite incredible because there was a new genomic DNA study in 2016 that revealed that Aboriginal Australians are one of the oldest known civilizations on earth with ancestries stretching back roughly 75,000 years. I always believe that there is truth within a myth. And when Western society dismisses or discards something, I am always quick to question why, because the powers that be are notorious for trying to hide ancient, mystical, esoteric, occult knowledge of our original human template to keep us believing we are powerless and in need of their constant direction and supervision. I can tell you with absolute certainty, with all of my being, that we are far more powerful than we have been led to believe. Now we visit the Sonia Nyankunyaji, 
a small community in the Peruvian Amazon whose lives are guided by their unique relationship to dreams. They have developed a sense of multinatural perspectivism, and they explain this as Ishwa, which loosely translates as spirit or soul. Eshwa forms a core of personhood, shared by all beings, including humans, plants, animals. It actually reminds me of the Avatar movies when they refer to the land as Ewa, and all beings are connected through her spirit. This beautiful concept implies a blurring of dreaming and waking realities, the connection between the seen and unseen, the visible and invisible, because essentially, it's all one. By giving animals and all animate beings a dimension of personhood through Eshua, their human identity is able to pass through different realities and gain knowledge through their dream narratives. Their dream reality gives them a literal, metaphorical, and prophetic source of information. So dreaming of certain animals are interpreted as omens, and they even dream of plants to cure sickness, as well as where to find food. Another use for dreams for the Sonia Kunyaji is to receive the personal names of their children. And this can be dreamt by the mother or father, and the name of the child is revealed in the dream through an interaction with an animal. Whatever kind of animal reveals itself in a way that is specific to both the men and women having the dream becomes the name of that child. These are revered as their true names, signifying the connection between their everyday waking life, their earth reality, and the cosmos. Our next stop on this dream ship are the Chippewayan people, who are an indigenous group of Athabascan people living in the subarctic regions of northern Canada, who also have a similar connection with their dreams. For these people, traditional ways of hunting, trapping, and fishing are very important to their way of life, and their success lies in their ability to maintain harmony in their interrelationships, particularly the relationship among human and animal where the animals are referred to as animal persons. Animal persons are essentially a spiritual dimension of personhood that all animals have. The belief that humans and animals are not separate from one another. Their holistic belief is that the animal's spiritual aspect is never separate from its physical aspect, in the same way that one's dreams are not different to their waking life. The Chippewayan's worldview is not dualistic, but rather monistic, where spiritual and physical reality exists as one. Their harmonious relationship and respect for animals creates this relationship where animal spirits will appear to them in their dreams and guide them through daily life, including where to hunt, where to find food, practical knowledge on survival, and even predicting the weather. Next, we find the traditions of the East Cree people who believed that the permission of the animal determined the hunter's success in securing any form of food. They required the consent of the animals who, in friendship to man, had to allow themselves to be taken. They believed that spirits influenced the animal's behavior, availability, and distribution. And how do these people communicate with these spirits? Through dreams. Under normal conditions of sleep, the dream visitation occurs when a spirit comes towards the hunter in his dream and appears as a person talking to him. The animal, once again, is personified. This very sacred way of communication placed great emphasis on remembering the content of the dream in exact detail. As the Cree said that if a man could no longer remember his dreams upon awakening, he could no longer hunt. Going back to the Peruvian Amazon a few stops ago, we also have the Achuar people, who are called the dream people. Very similar to the Aboriginal cultures of Australia and New Zealand, such as the Mori, they do a lot of work in the astral dream place. They see themselves as a result of nature, not in opposition to nature, the way that we do in the West which is why they're able to understand their connection to all things and the knowledge field. 
using a sort of telekinesis, they used dreams to communicate with each other. In the mid-1990s, for the first time, they actually used dreams to reach the Western world, particularly a woman named Lynn Twist, who they'd never met before. Their faces would appear in her dreams, and it wasn't until synchronistic, unrelated events brought her to the Amazon that she ended up seeing these faces in person. Her story is pretty fascinating if you want to dig a little further. You can look her up. Lynn, L-Y-N-N-E, and then Twist. T-W-I-S-T. I also want to mention that this type of synchronicity is called chiromancy, which is a term coined by Robert Moss. This word literally means divination by special moments. And it is essentially the dreamer's way of navigating through life all the time. This includes when you see repetitive numbers, commonly referred to as angel numbers like 111, 333, and so on at certain moments that feel divinely inspired and cause you to take notice and act. Now, let us travel all the way back to the pyramids, to a time of magic and wonder. Dream interpretation connects back to the ancient Egyptians around 1350 BCE with the first written record of dream interpretation. It's known as the Chester Beatty Papyrus. It's valued as the oldest dream book in existence that we know of because, let's face it, there's a lot that we really don't know. (laughs) This book showed images of what certain dreams meant. Through dreams, people were given prophecies, warnings, advice, and they also believed that the gods used dreams to reveal themselves. There were even dream interpreters who were temple priests called masters of the secret things, I'm not quite sure if that was a direct translation. It probably sounded a lot more, what's the word, esoteric in its original language. (laughs) But anyways, these educated priests took most of their knowledge from the Egyptian Book of Wisdom, the Book of the Dead. Certain members of the elite class could also look up dreams in a dream book to help with interpretation. These included the scribes of Deir al-Medina. New Kingdom texts from Deir al-Medina referred to an advisor called the Wise Woman who could be consulted in addition to or instead of an oracle. To me, I think she was an oracle, but... (laughs) Anyways. Astral travel for these ancient Egyptians was quite advanced as they developed a practice of conscious dream travel which sounds to me a lot like a sort of focused astral projection. They crossed time and space in the dream bodies of birds and animals. So they were essentially practicing shape-shifting. Roads of the afterlife and the multidimensional universe were explored through this conscious dream travel. It was understood that true initiation and transformation takes place in a deeper reality accessible through the dream journey beyond the body. The ancients actually called sleep the little death because in the dream state, we have no physical body just like when we die. These wise ancient Egyptians understood that in dreams, our eyes are opened. Their word for dream, resut, spelled R-S-W-T, is connected to the root meaning of to be awake. It was written with a symbol representing an open eye. And I'm just going to leave that right there. (laughs) Traveling a little bit further forward in Hellenistic times, the age of Cleopatra. Dream schools flourished in the temples of Serapis, a sun god. From the 2nd century BCE, we have papyri recording the dream diaries of Ptolemaios. Not too long after, A less well-known, or rather forgotten, master was Synesius of Cyrene, a Greco-Roman aristocrat and philosopher. When the Roman Empire was falling apart in the year 405 AD, Synesius wrote the treatise De Insomnis, which translates to On Dreams. It consists of two parts. The first part is a philosophical explanation 
on why dreams allow our soul to reach higher spheres of consciousness. The second part is a more down-to-earth and very accessible account of the way we must investigate our dreams, which really comes down to keeping what he called a night book, or what we modernly call a dream journal. And at some point, I'll have a separate episode for that, focusing specifically on dream tools. Synesius was adamant, and I quite agree with him, that deception arises through false interpretations, not false dreams. I actually really liked the way that he said it. He said, we should not confuse the weakness of the interpreter with the nature of the visions themselves. It really was one of the wisest books ever written on dreams, coincidence, and imagination, and it's rarely talked about, like most truly empowering pieces of history. He's also quoted as saying, We ought to seek this branch of knowledge before all else, for it comes from us, is within us, and is the special possession of the soul of each one of us. With dream divination or prophetic dreams, It's no surprise that we're shown the future because dreams are experiences of soul. And as Synesius also said, the soul holds the forms of things that come into being. So beautiful. He insisted that we claim authority over our own dreams, rejecting anything and anyone who tries to come between us and the dream source. He also urged us to record and pay attention to the oracles that speak to us when we are asleep and awake. He instructs to keep a day book for our observations of signs and synchronicities, as well as the night book for dreams. He encouraged this by saying, All things are signs appearing through all things. They are brothers in a single living creature, the cosmos. They are written in characters of every kind. I really love it because his beliefs mirrored all of the beautiful indigenous cultures I've already shared. So you can see and hear that they all share a common thread. Synesius taught that the soul is most at home in the hollow gulf of the universe, which he said is the realm of imagination. He defined imagination as the halfway house between spirit and matter, which makes communication between the two possible. Such a good explanation. Because this is the realm the soul travels when dreaming. Imagination is the bridge. Speaking to the idea of imagination as a bridge between the spirit world and the material world, if you know me well, you know that every time I watch a Marvel movie, I find occult symbols and teachings hidden in plain sight. If you look close enough, they're right in front of you. But when things are in plain sight, we are easily conditioned to ignore it or label it as fiction. It's a purposeful tactic used by those doing the conditioning. (laughs) So last year, I watched Doctor Strange in The Multiverse of Madness. And one quote that really stood out to me was when he said, Dreams are windows into the lives of our multiversal selves. After he said that, I basically yelled, I've been saying this all along (laughs) because this is really what I believe dreams are made of. Doorways, portals, gateways into other realms, other worlds, other lifetimes, other versions of ourselves. Another intriguing revelation that was put forward by one of the main characters, America Chavez, was that Dreams aren't actually random collections of images, sounds, and sensations, but in fact are these echo-like windows into the experiences of our multiversal selves, or as Marvel likes to call them, our variants. Essentially, dreaming is a form of time travel, which is what the ancient civilizations and cultures have been trying to tell us all along. Based on my own life experience, a lot seems to happen to me in the space I call the (laughs) in-between, as I mentioned earlier, such as the messages I receive, my clairvoyant abilities, my clairaudience, the past life visions I have, my mediumship abilities, the interdimensional beings that I meet. It often happens in this state of not being fully awake, but also not being fully asleep. 
and a lot of the times it's really hard to tell the difference. It almost feels like dipping in and out of an ocean of awareness and my mind is half in the water and half out, if that makes sense. I believe it's the same brain waves as a trance because you're accessing higher states of consciousness, putting you also in the, I believe it's the theta brainwave. I personally view it as your energetic body, your consciousness, is able to travel between dimensions while your physical body remains rooted, which literally makes you the bridge between worlds. Your soul, your true self, never sleeps. I decided for the first time to research if other people experienced this in-between state too and realized someone coined the term liminal dreaming a while back. Clearly, I am not the first. <laughs> liminal just means a kind of border zone between the two brain states on either edge of sleep. So right before you wake and right before you fall asleep. There's hypnagogia, which literally means going towards hypnos, the Greek god of sleep. And then there's its early morning mirror state, hypnopompia, which is going away from hypnos, going away from sleep. I'm not even sure if I said those Greek words right, so once again, forgive me. <laughs> but basically, if you pay attention, a lot is revealed during this liminal space, or what I prefer to call the in-between. Well, it started raining a little bit harder here. I'm not sure if you can hear it or not. <laughs> but when you live in a tiny home, sounds are a lot more amplified. So I think this is my cue to end the episode here because we already covered quite a bit today and there is really way too much history to cover in under an hour. I really wish I could have went deeper, but I need a lot more time than that. If you want to look into other beliefs and schools of thought about what dreams are and where they come from, you can look deeper into all of the cultures I briefly mentioned, as well as Aristotle, Plato, the Dogon tribe of West Africa, the Mori of New Zealand, Sosipatra, Hypatia, the Oracles of Delphi, Nikola Tesla, Carl Jung, Robert Moss, to only name a few, because there are plenty. <laughs> and I'm sure I will think of so many more after this podcast is released. But that's the nature of podcasting. Learning to let go of perfection and release something as it is. If you want to share your own ancestors' beliefs and traditions around dreams and the dream time, I would so much love to hear from you. Please send in a voice message and tell your story. You can find the link in the show notes below. As this episode comes to a close, remember that we all have our own dream language that requires awareness, attention, and practice to decode. Next week, I'm going to share with you the four types of dreams that I channeled seemingly out of nowhere one day that may help you unlock your own dream gates and decode your own dream language. And when I say I channeled it literally out of nowhere, I was in the middle of writing a shopping list and the words just poured out of me, channeling at its finest. And we're all channels. It's not limited to one person or another person. We all have that ability because we are the bridge between the worlds. Everything is always in constant communication. From the landscape around you to the dreamscape within you. As within, so without. There are messages all around you, all the time. I encourage you this week to take the time to listen. Pay attention to the signs, the symbols, and the synchronicities, the oracles of the night and of the day. Dream yourself awake.